Not exactly the most uh, exciting episode to start the year off, but here we are. Woo, as they say. I do have to admit, this really is kind of an unmemorable episode, isn't it? Like, there's one pretty good thing about it, which I'll talk about in a moment, and we, it is nice to see Slash, Buzz, and Slugger, but for the most part, it's just kind of there. And it also has the fake twist thing going, which I'll talk about in just a second. This is a Brennan Braga vehicle, and it was helmed by David Livingston. But the weird thing is, they brought it out, and Pillar was actually asking Braga to work on this. This is right about when they really started pushing Braga to just churn out script after script. And that's going to become more and more obvious as we get further into TNG here, by the way. So, while there's some good stuff he pushes out, then there's some other stuff, but I'm getting off topic. So, he put it together, and it's basically the episode as is, with one noticeable exception. There was no mid-fake twist. They were just, you know, the, the penal colonists who were trying to, to escape by impersonating the people, and then the end, that was it. That was the episode. And so they decided to go ahead and say, nope, like Pillar actually flat out said, this, this is unfilmable, we can't do this. So they handed it off to this other guy, uh, Herb Wright, Herb Wright, excuse me, who looked at it and said, I've got it. They're ghosts. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I say that so condescendingly. But I, I don't feel like it adds anything to the episode. As weird as this may sound, I don't think the inclusion of the, oh, we're secretly Starfleet ghosts angle actually makes the episode any better. Now, that's just my opinion, and I'm actually very curious of what you guys think of this as well. But for me, even if you played this episode straight, it would just be the way it is. In fact, it might actually be a little bit better. That being said, I do have to give Braga and Herb, or Herb, excuse me, some credit, because there are some hints as to things going wrong pretty early on. At the same time, though, I do have to admit that even as a kid, when I was seeing this for the first time, I didn't buy it for a second. We are, I am Captain Schumar, and we're here, and I'm like, okay, no you're not. And that was just my knee-jerk reaction, just pure emotional kind of gut check, right? And then it gets to the point where they're like, oh my gosh, yes, we are spirits, and we wish to move on. I'm like, yeah, no, okay, they're just blowing smoke. At this point, that is a complete lie, there's no way. Which brings me to the episode proper. I, I did mention there was one thing that's very memorable about this episode, and that's the directing. So, this was a David Livingston piece, and I've praised the hell out of the man as a director. I love his directing. But, I thought about going down and, and, and just writing every little scene where he does some really creative stuff throughout it. But the problem is, it's almost every scene. I honestly encourage you, especially those of you who are watching these with me, to sit down and really pay attention to what he does with positioning and camera throughout the whole work. I'm only going to mention one of the incidents, because it's, in my opinion, the best example of it. Right at the beginning, you've got a scene where Picard, Riker, and Data are all talking to each other, and it's all relatively dry. It's not boring, per se, but it's just, it's a Tuesday, right? It's just everyday operations. And while they're talking, at a certain point, you hear this tss, just vaguely in the background, and Troy walks in. Now, she's out of focus, but you see her over there. And she's, she walks in, like, staring at the view screen. Then she walks over to Worf, who's at, the, who's at Tactical. She kind of looks up at him for a second, and Worf kind of does this, like, go ahead. And so then she goes and actually starts looking at the thing. And this whole time, the conversation is still going. And then, for the entire rest of the scene, the camera follows Troy as... So she's going back here behind... You know, she, she goes to the, the scanners, looks at the planet, and then she goes back here around to here. So the camera is following her this entire time, pivoting on the, the main conversation going up front. And it's, it's actually really well done, wonderfully understated. And, as a bonus point, I'm actually curious how many of you noticed that without me pointing it out or without rewatching it to look for it. Again, I don't mean to, to sound like, oh, it's so, you know, you didn't even see it. But it's more like it's so well done that it's a natural and smooth transition. Because by the end of the shot, it's all one cohesive shot, the camera then zooms in on Troy herself and actually pulls her into focus. It's just, it, it's really good stuff like that. And that's the kind of, kind of the stuff that I really like about Livingston. He also got to work with set 16. Or excuse me, stage 16. Isn't that fun? For those of you not aware, stage 16 is the big 
uh, outdoor stage over at Paramount's lot. I actually, I don't know if it's there anymore. I shouldn't say that as if it's present tense. Used to be the big outdoorsy lot. It was where you would do things like, oh my god, we're in the middle of a desert or whatever, right? And they apparently had a lot of hassles and a lot of problems because they had this big storm and blah, blah, blah. But the advantage of Stage 16 is it's designed for large, wide-angle shots or shots that are intended to be done on a crane where the... Uh, the tracks and whatnot that the crane is moving on are not visible in the shot because of because of the way they've got the, the arm set up. So he could do a whole bunch of stuff with that. And so if you notice, a lot of the shots around the crash site tend to have some cool camera work as well because of that. So you're just playing around with that kind of a thing. Quick aside, did you know this is the episode that introduces pattern enhancers to Star Trek? It's actually funny to me because it's something I consider so normal as to be a mundane aspect of Star Trek at this point. And yet it wasn't introduced until Season 5, midway through Season 5, actually, in TNG. Just Every now and again I see little things like that and I'm like, wow, that's when we first introduced that? Holy crud. Anyways. So, Troy... <laughs> poor Troy. I should say poor Marina Sirtis. There's a bit where they all get shocked and they all get, you know, ah, and they fly back. That was actually Marina Sirtis doing that, and she actually injured herself in the process. I feel really bad for her. I'm not sure why she was doing her own stunt on the matter. Stunts are no laughing matter. There's all sorts of things you do with your body to make it, you know, roll or move or, or do stunts without actually causing injury to yourself. There, there's a whole line of science and art art that, that is around it. It's one of the reasons why you know, most actors don't do their own stunts, because it requires basically learning a whole new craft. Anyways, I just bring that up because she did her own stuff. She got injured by it, which is kind of what tends to happen. I do feel bad for her, don't mistake me, and it, it sucks. Especially for what such a basic shot, but whatever. Now, I noticed something. <laughs> this is... So often I complain in Star Trek, in fiction in general, but especially in Star Trek, where someone's like, I'm secretly evil, and nobody notices, right? Nobody notices anything is different. In contrast, in this episode, they notice something's up with Data and Consequently with Troy almost immediately. There's kind of a, huh, ah, that's strange. And then, of course, Data naturally th blows his cover immediately. But I'm just happy the episode didn't lean on that trope like it usually does in circumstances like this. Going as far back as Season 1 of TNG, if you remember what that Picard gets replaced episode. Now... I do have to say I like how they lock down the trio pretty hard and pretty fast. This is when I go ahead and admit that... How do I phrase this? If I point out that they use the wrong transporter in this episode, there are people who will think, oh, it's good on you for pointing that out. And then there are people who think, no, you need to point out even more problems. And then there are people who think, you're pointing out too many problems. No matter what I point out, I lose, is what I'm trying to say here. Because this is Star Trek. Star Trek is it's a huge bracket of people, and those bracket of people have a lot of variety of opinions. And I'm actually curious to see how many of you think I am over or under nitpicking this episode. But I do have to admit that while Braga obviously put a lot of thought into exactly how the hostage situation could work, the fact is there are still noticeable holes repeatedly throughout the work. The most simplest and obvious one is the transporters. Right at the beginning of the episode, they don't think to use the transporters even once. They don't even mention it. This is even weirder because towards the end of the episode, the transporters are considered one of the main threats to the hostages, and the, ho uh, excuse me, the hostage takers, the criminals, the crooks, you know, slash buzz and slugger, and they actually go out of their way to spend several minutes of screen time working around the we have to defend against the transporters problem. So why didn't they use them earlier? And it's strange. I know what you're thinking. Oh, well, because obviously they didn't know what they were dealing with. Yeah, but they were willing to do everything else quickly and easily. And in fact, with really only one exception, they actually succeeded quite a bit in shutting them down. The one exception is Worf. Yeah, Worf, buddy, I think maybe you should spend some more time in the targeting rage with Guinan because he sucked. In, in, when he charges in to the tent forward. Like, actually pay attention to that scene. I, again, nitpicking. But pay attention to that scene for a second, because he charges in, shouts a warning, about three seconds pass, then he starts actually firing. His first shot doesn't do much, 
and then his second shot, which takes several seconds for him to get off, barely grazes Troy. These things have a stun setting, right? That That's designed to, to stun someone, to send electrical signals throughout their body to neuralize them. I mean, I, I could be misremembering here. It's also probably worth noting that later on they mentioned they could just do a wide beam stun to knock out everyone in the room and sort it out later, which pro would also probably have been a good idea, and in fact is something that Tuvok ends up doing over on Voyager. He was possessed at the time, so we could forgive him the competency, but you get the idea. And so instead they just decide to fail. And I really feel like what happened was he was constructing the narrative of how this hostage situation starts, and he just ran into that wall of, well, Worf has to fail. And you know what that's like as a writer, right? Well, the good guys have to fail, otherwise the episode's over. It's just such a shame because, I mean, I could think of several ways to work around that. For example, just have Data be quick enough, on, excuse me, not Data, I don't know which is which, uh, not Data quick enough on his reflexes to, as soon as the door opens and Worf comes through, Data has already turned and fired a shot at Worf. Worf is like, oh, and he starts to go down and he gets like one shot off, which doesn't do anything because he's he's literally falling unconscious as we speak. There you go, mission problem solved. Instead, Worf just kind of fails. Now, this is, and I want to talk about this briefly if you'll forgive me this indulgence. This is part of why I like to talk about nitpicky things when it comes to Star Trek. Not just because I like to analyze how I think things could have been done or should have been done better, but to also appreciate what we actually get as a consequence. It's probably worth noting that despite my earlier comments of unmemorableness, I actually like this episode. It's basically a character vehicle for Picard and Marina Sirtis to play off of each other, with a few other little nice little highlights here and there. Uh, Brent Spiner actually does a good job of the, the, the crude, petty thug who's just just kind of coarse and, and short, you know, he's short-sighted and he's got a temper and he just wants to, come on, like, come on, Klingon. Oh, here, let me throw away my gun. Bring it on. You know, he, he does a good job of that. O'Brien, excuse me, the actor who plays O'Brien and his portrayal of... This is probably me reading too much into this. I'll go ahead and admit that. But the way he acts around Keiko is actually really, really good, in my opinion. They only get a few scenes together, but each one of them is gold. Because he comes across as not... Like, you'd expect someone like that to be, you know, oh, I guess you're my wife, huh? Sleaze, sleaze. But instead he comes across as confused. Like, he's looking at her and processing the memories that he has access to, and he has no idea what to make of them. Like, you're... I know you. I know what that is, and... And there's just... And he looks so lost. You can almost get the implication, and this is why I say I'm probably reading too much into this, that whoever he is, is someone who is so detached from that kind of... I hate to use the word intimate. Intimate connection with someone that he doesn't know what to think of it anymore. And he wants it, but he's not even sure why he wants it. So that's why he's just kind of... Huh? Huh? You know. And if you pay attention, each of the three of them gravitate towards one other character as a consequence of their own characteristics. O'Brien is obvious, or fake O'Brien. Fake Data is, of course, the thug. He wants to have someone who he can push his, push his chest up against, right? Someone he can beat in a fight and really prove himself, really show himself. And, of course, Troy, fake Troy, the thinker, the cruel, calculating intellect, is the one who attaches to Picard. I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Anyways. But this is why <laughs> I do have to mention these little nitpicks. That probably doesn't make any sense. Ah, whatever. Moving on. So I'm looking at my notes here. Let's, let's get back on track. Oh, yeah, speaking of war failing, Lita failed, too. I'm wondering if that was on purpose. Maybe this, maybe these people were actually telepaths, and Lita just didn't want the telepaths to be injured. You know, she gets a little bit you know, psychotic about that later. So she deliberately took a dive, like, oh, no, I couldn't beat them more, sorry. That might make a little bit more sense. So they start figuring out a way to resolve the situation, to, to fix this whole problem. And the first thing they go in the direction of is Technobabble. Now, I'll go ahead and admit, my first reaction was to be like, Ugh. But once again, we see how this technobabble isn't ludicrous yet. Not to the extent that some of later Star Trek, including TNG itself, will get into. 
Instead, it's a fairly basic problem. They have several advantages, so we're going to try and remove those advantages. We need to figure out what the beings in them are so we can neutralize them. We need to try and stun them in a, in a short and quick area. We need to get rid of the transporter. We need, to, or excuse me, the, the the force field. We need to get rid of their control of the hostages. Okay, so they just kind of start working at each of these points bit by bit. It is still a degree of techno babble, and it should be acknowledged as such. But I think this is actually a better application of it than some of the sheer nonsense we'll see later. And if I could explain that really quickly. One of the things that's always pissed me off most about Technobabble is, I would say the worst thing about Technobabble, is when it's a Technobabble problem and a Technobabble solution. What's the problem? Now oh, we've got a super enphased calculamish Durgonagoo, and the Durgonagoo is, is preventing us from doing something. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, what if we go ahead and repolarize our Megagagon, and if we repolarize it at just the right time, we'll splash it with paratons, and that'll get rid of the degegagoo. Now, everything I just said was nonsense, and in fact, I think I screwed up my own pronouns in the middle of that. But does, does that explain why I dislike Technobabble on Technobabble action? <laughs> because it's just nonsense explaining away nonsense. Nonsense helping to reach a solution to explain away a logical and actual problem. Uh, okay, I'm a little more on board with that. Anywho, <clears throat> so there's this nice little bit where Picard decides to go ahead and go down and become the new hostage in exchange for the people who need medical attention. I would love to know your thoughts on if you think that was a correct decision or not. From a purely tactical perspective, from a moralistic perspective, however you want to debate it. I'm actually very curious because I may be a complete idiot, but I'm kind of with Picard on this one. He is, he st his stated reasoning is, I am a hostage no matter where I am. So me exchanging my position here gets them medical care, puts me in a position where I can try to figure out what we're dealing with and why, and gives us personal eyes on the situation in addition to Worf. So now we've got Worf and Picard both actively operating on the scene and able to coordinate and do what they can to figure out some kind of solution. And, of course, Picard at this point is aware of their primary plan, the bzz plan, the red circle plan, as we'll call it, the Xbox plan. And, therefore, he knows what to watch for and how to push for that. In short, he gains everything and loses very little. Now, the counter-argument that I usually hear for that is that Picard is basically putting himself in the line of fire, which is almost always a stupid decision when, when the leadership decides to walk in front of the gun, so to speak, uh, metaphorically as well as literally. There's a reason danger close is kind of a thing, right? Again, I'm not sure which to line on that. You know, I, I, I'm kind of with him on this one. I think it works in this case. But as ever, I'm very curious of your guys' thoughts. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm very dry today. Nah. Hmm. So... There's a really nice touch where Troy, fake Troy, mentions to the others that normally I would be the one who would be advising him in this situation. Quick aside, I've heard Marina Sirtis' natural in, uh, accent, and I really wish she had spoken like that in this episode. Instead of this pseudo-sonorous, I'm trying to talk like I'm a man thing. Or maybe she was just trying to sound villainous, I'm not sure which. But she kept trying to dip her voice down, and I don't think it worked very well. Uh, by contrast, if she had just used her native accent, I think that would have been a good enough contrast and would have helped to differentiate her be from you know, real Troy. Just, just my opinion. Just my opinion. Moving on. Moving on. So, <clears throat> Troy, fake Troy, admits that she would be the one advising Picard, and she flat out admits the first thing she would advise him to do is she would go ahead and try to gain their trust. This is the one and only thing that I think works for the fake twist of the ghosts thing. And that's the fact that she then uses that exact tactic on him by trying to gain his trust on the matter. By trying to insist that they are trustworthy. And she pushes this narrative several times throughout the hostage situation. It's actually kind of interesting to watch. Um, she recites a whole lot of facts that support her. And she shows knowledge of certain procedures but not the nuance of them. She herself demonstrates that she has an understanding of the situation without having comprehension of the situation. This is why, as I mentioned earlier, even as a kid, I didn't buy it for a second. Because she in no way acts like a captain, or a mad captain, or a, dement or a desperate captain. She acts like someone who's faking. 
And, I mean, it, she is. <laughs> that's kind of my point. And that's why I mentioned that the fake twist is going to... Again, curious of your thoughts on that, as always. So, she also likes to fake decency. Isn't this such a simple request we're requesting of you? And yet, at every t turn, Picard actually turns it around on her. In fact, he does it three times, I think, throughout the course of the episode. Maybe twice, but I know at least twice. And he turns it around on her and says, Listen, go ahead and end this. We'll, be, we'll help you. And each time Troy says, Nope, she just clams up on that the moment he brings that up. Because, of course, she does. Because she's lying, and what she says she wants is not what she actually wants. And I point, I point that out because her only argument in excuse of that is, I don't trust you which is hysterical on every level, that that's her reasoning. And it's so patently false that it's like, yeah, okay, sure. Moving on. I mentioned in my notes here, O'Brien, he is awesome. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, in the episode The Assignment over in DS9, this whole thing with Molly, or excuse me, Keiko and O'Brien would actually be flipped. How many Starfleet couples can say they've both been one half of the possessed by aliens problem? One other thing I do want to give this cre episode credit on is it seems like all the people who are possessed do have... They have access to the memories of the people, but not intimately like the actual person does. Like, they have to go searching for it. They have to hit the Google search bar and be like, all right, let's... Memories of transporter. You know, that's that's the feel they get across consistently, which is good. I do like that because that makes a degree of sense. I do have to nitpick one last thing before we go, for though, and I thought about nitpicking it earlier, but this is a good time to bring it up. How does any of this affect Data? I got an actually better question. Why is Data even on the team? Uh, they could have picked anyone to be the third, you know, I have been mind-controlled person. And they go with Data, probably the least likely person to be MC'd. On the other hand, they do manage to grab a human, a half-human, and an android, so maybe they're just trying to show that they can possess anything they want to, which is kind of messed up when you think about it. And while I'm on it, this whole penal colony, you know, they separate their spirits from their bodies. How do their spirits then have control, you know, the ability to function as energy beings? How do they have a reliance on environment to function? Like, it's mentioned that they'll die if they're ejected into space. Why? Will they dissipate? Do they need oxygen? I mean, that is an M-class moon, speaking of nitpicking, an M-class moon with nightmarish storms so horrible that they can't see or beam through them, and a shuttle crashes simply trying to move through it. Oh, yeah, thanks, Troy, by the way, for all that. <clears throat> this, if, if you can't tell, I, tr I tried to start a little bit positive because this episode really flounders in its core logic for me at basically every level. And I, I'm just kind of picking away holes in it because I don't get where they're even going with this. That being said, that being said, I do actually like the, the finale. Picard goes ahead and is honest. He, he starts being very helpful. And they're like, why are you being helpful? And he says, honestly, getting you to your destination and what you want gets you away from these hostages, hostages, which are my top priority. And he's right. He's not lying whatsoever in saying that. He is deceiving, of course, but he is not lying at all. And then he suggests specifically Cargo Bay 4. Now, I'm not sure why, I think it was 4, I'm not sure why 4 is specifically the one that can be, but hey, whatever, I'm with it. You know, it's a cargo bay that can be flushed into space. I'm with that, that makes sense. It basically twists things around, and like I said, this is where I, where I kind of like the finale. Because the finale is a weird series of competencies in a row. So all of a sudden the transporters are conditioned again, first of all. And, no, actually, you know what, that's more like third of all. First of all, Picard realizes how he can turn the situation to his advantage. They have a very nice locked down fort. They need to move away from this fort. He suggests a place to move to that's advantageous to him, point one. Point two, he then tells Riker over the comm, this is where I'm taking them. And he doesn't even use code words or phrases. He doesn't have to. By the way he's saying it, and again, credit to, to directing and acting, you can tell that both LaForge and Riker immediately pick up on, ah, okay, that's where he's going with it. The episode makes a point of even it basically admit, telling the audience later why they're completely on board with this, because of the whole venting the cargo bay thing. 
Then, point three of competency, the transporters, which are suddenly an issue. And they remember they have transporters on the shuttles, which, honestly, it's astonishing how often Star Trek forgets that they have transporters, functional transporters on their shuttles on board their ships. It would probably have solved, I don't know, 40 episodes across all of Star Trek, especially Voyager, if they would remember that, but I'm getting off track. So that's credit to the competency of Rolar in there, that she actually thought of that as a way around this. And, of course, the, you know, the O'Brien, fake O'Brien caught it. Then they move in a nice tense standoff to the cargo bay, and as soon as they're... The whole time, Picard's basically doing nothing other than, you know, we're just moving. Then they get there, and Picard immediately drops all pretenses of assistance and starts turning the screws onto them. Because he's won. The moment he managed to move that team into the cargo bay, he had succeeded at his stated task. He had successfully, and this is what I like about it, taken them hostage. And so he wins by taking them hostage. Cute, Braga. I do also have to admit I'm amused that these penal colonists care enough about each other to not want them to die in order to, to be willing to go back to the colony. And, by the way, I'm not even going to bring up the dozens of problems I have with this penal colony. Like, apparently they were abandoned here five centuries ago, which is a, a while, if you're not aware, and haven't been back since, and yet they insist on their going home? Is their home even there? Have, have people been dropped off regularly? You know, is this... What kind of alien species rips the soul out of a being and then tosses it into a penal colony for imprisonment? Like, how are the souls remaining in prison? Uh, there's just there's questions. There's infinite questions here. None of this makes sense. Which leads me to my final thoughts. This episode is a good example of what I would call the average of Star Trek. Directing, acting, and execution managed to make something that's not really all that good and doesn't really make all that much sense at least moderately enjoyable. And that's why I ultimately end with the same thing I started with, calling this episode average. I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts. I'll see you next time. Which